Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 108 of PD's Awesome Guest Panel. And still, I can't believe I reached the triple digits. I didn't think I was going to reach one digit, let alone three. Now, before we introduce tonight's iconic uh, guest star here this evening, I would like to introduce tonight's co-host for this evening and my good buddy, Mr. Christopher Patty. Hey, yo. Good to see you again, Chris. Good to be here. Likewise, brother. <laughs> now, to introduce tonight's special guest star, uh, she's done many, many projects. She's a veteran actress. You may know her works from such uh, from such projects such as Dragnet, Star Trek, uh, Murder She Wrote, and one of my all time favorite Muppet, Muppet movies of all time, The Muppets Take Manhattan as Jenny. My guest at this time is Miss Juliana Donald. Juliana, welcome. How are you today? I am doing great. It's great to be here. Great to have you. And as a longtime fan of the Muppets, let me just say Muppets Take Manhattan will always have a special place in my heart. It's actually, as a New York native, that movie will always have a special place in my heart. It's my favorite Muppet movie of all time. I love it, too. I mean, not just because I'm in it, but, you know, they, Miss Piggy and Kermit got married. The Muppet Babies were introduced. Some of the songs are so great. The soundtrack is great. So anyway, it's one of my favorites, too. Awesome. And before we get we dive into those questions, I do have some uh, preliminary questions before we get started. And and that one is going to be a cliche question, and that is, how and when did you get your first big break and or start into acting? Take us there. Wow. Okay. Um, I uh, moved to New York um, to, I guess my first big break was I got a Kellogg's Rice Krispies commercial. And... Um, and I was uh, going on auditions and I just went on a few commercial auditions and I got that. And I used to be a ballerina. So I played a ballerina in the commercial and it was great. And that was that commercial gave me the ability because back in the old days, you could really make a lot of money when you did a commercial. You can't anymore, but back then you could. And so that gave me enough money that I was able to really focus on acting. So my first big break was... Um, was a play I did off Broadway um, at the Douglas Fairbanks Theater in New York, and it was a um, it was a Irish play uh, called Big Maggie, and we got terrible reviews by the New York Times, so they closed after like a week. But it was um, real prestigious at the time, and um, and uh, right after that, I got the Muppets Take Manhattan, and that was kind of amazing because um, they had been interviewing people for a very long time looking for this person to play Jenny. And they had auditioned all sorts of stars, young stars and everything. And um, so I came in at the very end when I guess they were desperate and had to make a decision, which is the perfect time to go in for an audition. So that was a good thing. Very cool. And yeah. uh, I can't wait to ask you because I have so many questions for Muppets Take Manhattan. It's, uh, like I said to you earlier, it's one of my favorite Muppet movies of all time. And you not only were in the movie, but you played a very uh, big part in it because you worked in Pete's Luncheonette. And right, I'm right. And I'm, my name is Pete, too. So it, it's funny that you, you, uh, you're on a show called PD's Awesome Guest Panel and you worked at Pete's Luncheonette as Jenny. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, Chris, you had a question? Are there any preparations or methods you do before a particular, yeah, before a particular role? Um, well, it depends on what the role is. Um, for uh, do we want to talk about the Muppet role or do we want to talk about other roles? Or because it it all depends on what the if it's a comedy, if it's a drama, if it's you know if it's uh, um, that was kind of the Muppet movie was kind of different because you're talking to felt eyes. So it was a little bit of different preparation than other things. But anyway, I always try to do uh, research and I try to do um, figure out what kind of clothes the character's wearing, uh, the accent the character has, because a lot of that informs who the character is, so. Uh, and I have a question before you ask that question, a uh, next question, Chris, I do have a question related to that though, because you mentioned it depends on the role that you do, whether it's comedy or drama. I want to give you a scenario, uh, Ms. Donald, where like, it's, and this is the question I ask all uh, the actors and actresses to come on my show. And that is the raw emotion question. Say that I'm going to put you in a scenario. Say that you are doing a scene 
in which you and your fellow co-star are required to get into this heated argument which in which your character has to yell at this character and they have to get into an argument. And your co-star goes up to you, and I'll say me as an example. Say If I go right. come up to you and say, Miss Donald, I would say Miss Donald because I have so much respect for you in the world. I would say, Miss Donald, uh, this scene requires us to get into a heated argument in which, you know, that tells good storytelling and we got to make it feel real to the audience. Now, I know uh, I had an idea to make the, to enhance this scene. So I was thinking about, like, uh, if you lambast me so hard that you can make me cry for real, I think it's not only good storytelling, but it makes the audience at home make uh, believe that this is real life. If you were to approach with this type of method, how would you react and what would you tell to that said co-star? Um, okay, so that's a good question. Um, what If I had to do a scene or when I've had to do a scene where I have to argue with somebody, um, usually... Um, you have to get into the shoes of the character. You have to get into, and they have to get into the shoes of the character. A lot of times, which what's really, really super helpful is to have kind of rehearsals ahead of time with the character. And um, you can never really tell an actor what they should be thinking. Like, hey, I want to make you cry. That has to be kind of an organic thing that comes from them. And they have to be, but what you can say is that, you know, what you can, what you do have um, say over is your emotions, how you feel, how uh, strong your, your um, emotions are going to be at that situation. And they have, you know, the same thing. They, they, and they can react off of you. Sometimes a director will say, push it here at this, I want it this air, I want, when you get to this place, I want you guys to be really screaming at each other, and sometimes they'll say, hey, I want you to um, tone it down. Just because you're toning it down doesn't mean you're not going to get tears in your eyes and you're not going to be super angry, because you don't have to be screaming to be angry, and sometimes not screaming is more powerful than screaming. So, um, but as far as, like, telling the person I want to do this and I want to bring you to tears. I think I've never really um, gotten into a situation like that unless I was talking a scene over with someone and it was kind of a mutual conversation where they said, okay, this is going to really push my button. And at that point I'm going to go to a number 10 from another number two. So, uh, so just watch out. But as far as like telling some, trying to trying to make the scene go in a certain way, it's it's kind of difficult to do that. When, when you said get into like the uh, shoes of the actors, would you say that's the art of like being a method actor? Yeah, I mean, I was trained as a method actor, so um, that's another reason why I don't usually tell somebody, "Hey, I think you should be this way," because a lot of times, if you say that to an actor, they'll get really mad like really mad and they won't talk to you anymore and you don't want that but um but you know method acting is basically getting a situation that's similar to what the emotions of the character are in that in that scene so maybe somebody's like maybe a word really hits somebody and that makes them start crying or that makes them that has to come you your experience in life might not be the same that the character is going through but everyone in the world can find something that makes them get upset in that same way in their life and that's that's what method acting is trying to get to that place and then letting it just like you're riding a ride letting it just go for this character so most important thing is to know your lines so well that you're not thinking of the lines you're thinking of the emotions i see so you have to like think of like real life real world situations to tap on the real emotion Yes. So, you know, maybe somebody, you know, you're doing a scene of somebody losing their uh, sister or something and you don't have that experience, but you do maybe, I mean, this is going to sound crazy, but it, it, this is something you can do, but you do have an experience of losing maybe, uh, you know, a friend moving out of the neighborhood or losing an animal or losing a pet or losing a that all that stuff can be that emotion. We all have so much emotion in us that can be brought to the scene 
where you have to lose something that you don't might not have experience, but you do have experience for the emotion for that, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. Um, Chris, your next question. Oh, we can't hear you, Chris. Yeah. All right, sorry about that. You're good. Just uh, trying to muffle out the background noise I got here. No worries. All right, so would you prefer playing the hero or the villain? The villain is always the most fun, but I never, I always was cast as like the nice person, but always playing the bad guys, the, the fun thing. Absolutely. I, and you know, like there's seven people, like I said, say, that said the same exact thing you said. It's like, it's fun being the bad guy. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Because I mean, the bad guy is also a really um, interesting thing to be because you can't ever be the bad guy judging yourself as the bad guy. You have to be the bad guy thinking that everything you're doing is is good. You have to love being the bad guy. So yeah. that's why it's it's so to me it's like more challenging to be the bad guy than to be the good guy because you have to figure out how you can make somebody's horrible behavior be okay. Be good for that character if that makes sense. Totally. Uh and one project that you've done, and this is going to lead to the uh, next question here, and that is you worked on many projects, including the 1987 Dragnet. And this is going to lead to Chris's next question. Okay. <laughs> All right. So were your memories working on the 1987 Dragnet as the zookeeper? Um, that was a lot of fun. And um, Tom and uh, Tom Hanks and um, Dan Aykroyd were a lot of fun to work with. They gave me um, a little bit of leeway to add lines, and um, and it was just everybody was really happy. It was at the beginning of Tom Hanks's career, and um, and I think an early movie of Dan Aykroyd's too. But they were both super super nice, and who however the stars act is how happy the set is. So the set was very happy because the stars were really nice. The director was really nice. So it was just, it was a lot of fun. And it was um, really kind of, it didn't feel at all like we were doing a big movie. It very felt cool. like just, you know, having fun. Very cool. And another project you worked on was Murder, She Wrote. And the memories of working on Murder, She Wrote, uh, she wrote and working with Angela Lansbury. I love Angela Lansbury. Um, I did a TV series that was a spinoff of Murder, She Wrote called The Law and Harry McGraw with, um, why can't I, Jerry Orbach. And Jer that was from Murder, She Wrote. That was a um, part of Murder, She Wrote. The, the producer of Murder, She Wrote and The Law and Harry McGraw were the same. So Angela Lansbury's, she had a son that's a director. So he directed some episodes of the other show I did, The Law and Harry McGraw. So she's just, she is amazing and she's really professional and she's really like, um, I have had experiences on sets with diva stars, but she's not one. And maybe because she's from England and they're all like, not that way, but she was great. She was always you know, like, when you went to the set, she was always there ready to work. She always knew her line. She always, so it was, it was really pleasant. It was really fun to work on that. And um, I believe I had worked with that director before on that. So it was, it was good. Anyway. Cool. And um, Chris, I know you're a big fan of the next uh, project we're going to discuss. So I'm going to let you take it away, brother. All right. So memories working on Star Trek The Next Generation as Taya or Tanya. Oh, okay. Um, I get Deep Space Nine and, and those. Um, that was really difficult um mainly because i had to be in um not because anybody was difficult to work with um the cast members were all really nice the regular cast members but i had to be in makeup for four hours every day and i had to have this like cone head and it was so heavy on my head it was like this giant thing and if you touched the thing water would just pour out you couldn't lie down you couldn't do anything you just had to kind of sit straight up 
and the days were like, you know, we were shooting like 20 hours a day and I had forced calls every day. A forced call means you don't get, you're supposed to get 12 hours between when you get finished and when you go in the morning. If you don't get 12 hours, you have to have what's called a forced call, which they have to pay you extra money for that. But as a result, I was getting four hours of sleep a night. So that part was difficult. Working on it, all the people on it, great. It was really, um, you know, an amazing experience to have to, to work there and also to have to go to the cafeteria as that character and to have everybody stare at me. And, but anyway, um, and I did a game off of that show as well, a Star Trek game. So I remember, was that, wasn't that Borg? Yeah, it was some game that they did. They called up and asked me, can you come and do this game? So, but I was playing, luckily, a um, non-alien. But this is the thing about Star Trek, and I, you probably know this. If you are an alien, you can come back and you can do every single Star Trek for the rest of your life, as long as you come back as an alien. If you ever come back as a human, you can never do another Star Trek. <laughs> wow. <laughs> You always have to be an alien because the the Trekkies are so the Trekkies are so um, into Star Trek that they can't have anybody recognize somebody, uh, you know. That's you can't go back as a person. So, uh, Chris, you got a follow up, right? Uh, so, memories working on Deep Space Nine. Yeah, as loved it. Loved it. Uh, Aaron Shimmerman's really great. Um, the director, um, oh God, why can't I remember his name? Um, he was, um, because he has a long French name. He was, um, was it, was it Rene Aldubre? Rene Aubergenois, yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Rene is an actor. He was on the show and he was directing this episode. So what he did that I've never had, it, it's really rare in the business is he had us come and rehearse for two days. So by the time we shot it, it was, everything was so like perfect and it went really well. I still had to go through, you know, four hours of makeup and four hours of getting out of makeup because getting out of that makeup is actually more dangerous than getting into that makeup because it all has to be done really, really slowly to get that stuff off you. Um, but it was, um, that was a really, really pleasant experience um, because of, um, because of both Armin and Renee were great to work with, so. Oh, okay. But, um, who did you prefer though, Emmy or uh, uh, Tana? I preferred Deep Space Nine only because I, the, it was an easier job because we did the, the, Next Generation was more difficult because I was on the set longer hours. And I was in a lot of scenes. So um, a lot more scenes than I was in Deep Space Nine. So that was a tougher job. But um, uh, but Deep Space Nine I loved because um, of Renee and because of Armin. Very cool. And uh, one of the uh, most 90s shows you can say about, uh, uh, that you can think of in the 90s was Melrose Place. Uh, memories of working on Melrose Place as Lily Gray. Um, just that it was, um, well, um, well, the cast members were all friendly. Um, it was a little bit like um, far away that you had to go to the set. Um, it was not one of the sets. The set wasn't at like, you know, one of the main studios, Paramount or Sony or whatever. It was like really, it was, I remember having to drive a ways to get there. Um, and um, it was a little bit chaotic. It wasn't as smooth as some shows. But I think that had to do with the fact that it was so far away from one of the main studios. So, but it was, um, you know, it was, I don't have any, I had no, um, negative negative memories of, of that show at all okay and i was gonna say like the connection too because you did a muppet project you were in muppets take manhattan and heather locklear was the, the star of merrill's place right 
She yeah. actually, she actually appeared on a uh, television a Muppets TV show called Muppets Tonight, where she was a special guest, and she kind of reprised her Meryl's place character, in which all the characters on the Muppets were literally afraid of her. They were actually hiding in the closet just to stay away from her because they were that afraid of her because of her character, based on her character from Meryl's place. She was, I was in acting class with her. So it was when, you know, so she was really, really nice. But um, uh, we happened to have the same acting teacher at the time. But um, that's, that's funny. <laughs> so. yeah. um, Chris, your next question? Uh, some memories working on Babylon 5. Yeah, that was another one of those studios in the middle of nowhere. Um, and uh, there's all these studios that are like in, um the valley and that was another one that was like an hour or so away and it that was a show that was really kind of well run well and it was really kind of i felt like it was really fast um it, it was oh sorry my cat's meowing i have to pick him up no worries <laughs> otherwise he'll otherwise he'll keep screaming because he'll think i read one somewhere that um animals sometimes when you're talking they think you're talking to them so now, uh, before we continue i was just gonna say i have two turtles and they do the same exact thing when i'm on the phone talking with my friend chris here they start banging on the glass like they think i'm talking to them so they're trying to communicate <laughs> right right <laughs> <laughs> uh, i'm sorry but uh, continue with the uh, your experience on uh, oh babylon 5 it was it was a, it was a good experience that um there was a lady that i had worked on when I first started in the business, I did this like um, TV episode um, called a, a show called Riptide. I don't know if you ever heard of it. It was like a really kind of, um, I don't, I guess it was in the 80s or something. And um, it starred Perry, I can't remember his name, Perry. Anyway, um, one of the actresses on that is one of the actresses in Babylon 5, which is kind of interesting, which was kind of interesting. So, um, but I did not work with her in Babylon 5. I just went, it was, that was one of those jobs that was um, kind of real, you know, I auditioned, I got the job, I went and did the job. It didn't feel like anything. Um, like Star Trek, you feel kind of, it's a little bit more special, but that's also at Paramount Pictures, and they they treat everybody that comes in for Star Trek really, really well. Babylon 5 was in the middle of nowhere. Everybody was pleasant, but it wasn't like, you know, I felt like I worked pretty quickly my scenes, and then they just said, thank you so much. Bye. So that was that. I see. So it was like, do your, uh, do your part, uh, leave, uh, finish, and leave, right? And leave exactly. It wasn't any. It wasn't. It was kind of like felt like a machine, you know. Like they were just, they were just. Everything was. It was a fine to tune machine. They were just doing the stuff. They weren't doing a lot of takes. They weren't really. They were just getting the stuff done and moving to the next episode. Very cool. I see. And uh, another popular show you were on, and that was the X Files. And memories of doing the X Files as Nancy Klein and working with David Duchovny and Gillian Anderson. Yes, uh, that was really fun. Um, that was, uh, we had to go way into the valley and um, the guy that, that was really fun because we got to really, I got to really scream and um, and be terrorized. And so that's always a fun thing to do. And, um, and so, uh, and the actor that played my husband was great. And I did not, in my scene, I did not have David Duchovny or Gillian Anderson that was in my scene. So all my scene was done with the monster and my husband. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, so they were not on set at all, like during your uh, shooting? No. Well, they were probably, but we were shooting at a house in the valley that they had rented they had rented this house to um, do the scene because the scene was inside. They weren't on a sound stage like a lot of times they would do. We were at, in an actual house that they had rented on location, like in some nice neighborhood because they wanted to shoot other sequences. I guess they wanted to shoot the outside stuff with Jillian Anderson and David Duchovny. So, but we were inside the house. Oh, so. okay. And, um, Another show you worked on was Walker, the Texas Ranger, as D.A. Christy, uh, Christy Clark. And I want to get your memories working on that show. And uh, did you get to do scenes with Chuck Norris? Yes. 
He was great. Um, I had to get shot in it. Um, they didn't have any, um, I had to fly to Texas to do it. Um, and they didn't have any, um, they had to set up this whole gadget inside of me. They didn't, for some reason, I think maybe they had one. They should have gotten probably a few extra shirts, but they just had one that day. So they had to get the death in one take. So um, where I get shot. So it's a, it's a gadget that it, there's a sound, but then it bursts like blood comes out of your, the, your shirt but it's something that they stick underneath there and somebody off to the side presses a button and it goes. Psh. So that was kind of interesting because they had to do it perfect or they would have been, they would have to go out and buy me a new shirt or something. But the people were really friendly on that. It was fun to be in Texas. I got to, uh, um, I went to see, I was in Dallas. So I went to see the you know museum and the place where JFK had gotten shot and so it was kind of a fun trip because I got to kind of be a tourist as well because I had days off in between scenes. So you had fun like just touring touring the state of Texas and while well, at the same yes. time shooting in Texas. Exactly. I went to a rodeo, which I don't think I want to go to another one of those because I was like feeling sorry, too sorry for the animals. But um, I went to a rodeo. I went to, and some of the actors, we went out together. So um, we went to, they had like, um, I'm a vegetarian, but I went with people to steakhouses and they literally brought steaks that were like this big. I mean, they would feed 10 people and they, that would be one serving. So oh. Texas likes, Texas likes big pieces of meat. Bigger than a 72 ounce steak, right? Yeah. Like a huge steak, you know? So I guess, you know, you could take it home and eat it for a week or share it with your family or whatever, but it was, it was interesting to be there so okay <laughs> and um now Chris... i'm stationed in texas so she knows what she's talking about <laughs> but i'm stationed in texas so, oh, so yes, okay so you know yeah. have you been to like a steakhouse where they bring you this giant like i mean i couldn't w when they first came out i was like okay that's for three people and they're like no that's one person here i've only been to like one steakhouse and that's outback steakhouse that they have like uh, over at the uh, Freedom Crossing Strip Mall that's over right in the uh, area uh, of Fort Bliss. But uh, yeah, I haven't had the chance to experience too many others. Yeah, I don't remember. It was too long ago. Otherwise, I'd be able to tell you the name of the place we went. But it was, um, it was, I just remember everything in Texas is big, like big, big servings, which is, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And when they serve their meat, they did it in definitely pretty large portions. Yeah. I got to visit one day. <laughs> um, Chris, these next three questions are yours, buddy. Take it away. All right, then. Memories working on NYPD Blue as Cynthia Bunin. That was my favorite, one of my favorite jobs beside Memphis Take Manhattan because um, Dennis Franz is the truly one of the most incredibly wonderful um genuine like people you would ever meet in your life um he treated um you know guards the same as he treated big guest stars he just was lovely and um it was really crazy though because at the time we had a guy who was the writer who came up with my character and i wish i could remember his name he went off to do another series I want to say Everwood, but I, I'm not 100% sure. And he was um, one of their main writers, and he was he was a former heroin addict. So he had these things where he would just come up with ideas. They were always brilliant, but you would get a script sent to your house. You'd learn it. Then at 1 in the morning, there would be a new script with completely new new words, and you're like, oh, my God. You got to learn this on the way to the set. And then when you get in makeup, there's a new script. So it was kind of crazy. It was great because of Dennis, but it was a little bit crazy because the scripts were always changing and um, that's always challenging. Oh, I see. Um, All right. So uh, then uh, uh, this next one, 
Uh, Memories working on Touched by an Angel? Yeah, Touched by an Angel. I played a mom of a Down syndrome kid. And so that was interesting because I went to, I had to fly to Salt Lake City to do it. Um, Salt Lake City has a very large Mormon population. And so all the crew there is was Mormon. They were, you know, wonderful people. Um, and but it's very different from the crew you see in New York and Los Angeles, uh, the Teamsters. And um, so it was Salt Lake City. Um, I flew over with the producer and his wife, and um, they uh, d had decided to shoot there. I guess because it's not all the craziness of Los Angeles. It was really fun. Um, I was able to go to um, Sundance Film Festival also when I was there because that was really close. And um, I wasn't able to see much of um, much of Salt Lake City just because they, you know, got me in there and I just started working. The interesting thing was the lady that was taking care of the down syndrome kid and the down syndrome kid and she said oh you know everybody feels sorry for these kids but they're so happy and i remember thinking like wow that's kind of interesting you never think of you know uh i mean a lot of people look and say oh isn't that sad but you know it's it's not these kids were great and um happier than we are so you can learn a few things from them <laughs> But um, it was it was nice working on it. The um, Harry Hamlin was my husband; he was great, and um, the all the all the cast members were extremely friendly. They're all I think they're all Christians, and they're all really sweet. So, I see. Anyway, I don't know how long I'm supposed to talk answering the question. Oh no, you can take okay. as you can okay. as much as you want. Okay. <laughs> No limitations. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, All right. Uh, memories working on Judging Amy? Yeah. Um, okay. That was... Um, that was at Sony Pictures. And um, that was a... Um, more of a serious show. Um, but... Uh, most of the things on that were, um, were like pretty, it was just very straightforward and, you know, you got, you went to your fitting, you got your clothes, you knew your character, you went to, um, the director was, um, I'm not sure. I believe it was Bill Elia and, um, I just remember a lot of these, a lot of these directors on these shows. They were very, um, they had done a lot of other shows at Sony Pictures, so they were really, um, they were really super experienced, super, um, so everything was, everything went, went really smoothly. I just remember that having to go to a couple different fittings for, um, for the show, but I, I don't remember, I don't have any, like, you know, um, things that, stand out to me that was kind of more of a straightforward straightforward job I kind see. of like Babylon so it's like come in shoot it done right exactly exactly know your lines shoot it they'll tell you if you you know a lot of these shows if you if you say and and it's supposed to not have an and or something they'll come up to you and say you're not supposed to say and that was one of those shows they wanted it every single thing you know it I will not, you can't say I won't, you know, you, they, they want everything perfect. So that was one of those shows, but pretty straightforward. Oh, I understand. And the next question I'm going to ask, because this is my favorite role of all time that you did. And as a long time Muppets fan, I can honestly say as a little kid, uh, up until like, I'm going to say maybe fifth grade, I would watch Muppets take Manhattan religiously because I was such a huge fan of it. Like back in the VHS days. Um, your memories of shooting Muppets Take Manhattan as Jenny and working with Frank Oz and J the late great Jim Henson. Um, okay, that job was really magical because that was my first big job. And um, they, there's nothing that can prepare you for working with the Muppets. And the reason that I'm saying that is, is um, 
they have to build the sets four feet off the ground. Jim Henson and and, um, and uh, Frank Oz are both really tall men. And the way that they did it back then is they would have a headset on their head. They would have a little monitor in front of them. And then they would have their hand going up. So you're four feet above them. Uh, and they have their hand going up and their other hand is you know, doing maybe the other, it's, it's like a stick on the, on the, uh, whatever character they were playing. And so they would, um, so that was a little bit weird because if you made a step, you always had to be aware of where you were stepping because you could fall four feet down and kill yourself if you weren't careful. So you had to be really careful to, to not get overly exuberant and go over your marks. And um my best memory of that was we did this scene in the park where we jog Kermit and I jog and um Jim Henson was he wasn't directing that movie he was working on a lot of other things at the time and so he always had an assistant around telling him you know okay you have the call with blah 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 you have all these things and you have to do this and he was he was really busy he was juggling a lot of different things and I just remember that day that we shot that scene, he came to the park and um, they were setting up the camera and um, and these little kids started gathering around Kermit. They did not see or they did not like look at the fact that the Kermit was coming out of Jim Henson's hands. And Jim started talking with the kids. He loves kids. and for like 40 minutes these kids were just like mesmerized that kermit the frog was speaking to them and i just remember like you know his assistant coming saying oh you have a phone call then he's like okay later he didn't care about all these things he had to do he just wanted to play with the kids he just wanted to have fun with the kids and i just remember thinking that was that was really impressed me because um that's how he was always but that was the first day I worked with him. And um, I was just kind of really surprised at how um, he didn't care if, you know, they, I mean, they delayed the shooting so he could keep talking to these little kids. And first I was, you know, really impressed by how important Kermit was to all these little kids. Number two, that they could not even, they did not put it in their head that there was a man holding it, talking, and, um, you know, and three, that he was, everything he had to do was just kind of put on hold so he could play with the kids. That was beautiful. The fact that he didn't break character, like, so to maintain, like, that Kermit is real to the, the kids. And it, that's just beautiful. Like, he just took, yeah. out, took time out of his production schedule just to entertain the kids. Right. Yeah. It was, it was amazing. And then, um, on some of the scenes, if he wasn't able to be there a couple times, he was not able to be there for some small scenes. And so, um, they had his son played Kermit. Oh, Brian, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And I still remember that scene when he was jogging. That was in Central Park, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I... And it was just, so it was like so amazing because, you know, a lot of times when they do movies, there's a lot of sitting around and waiting till you do the scene. But in this case, it was like, you know, he didn't care. He's famous. He didn't care that all these, you know, thousands of kids were coming around and that they might have messed up the scene. He didn't care. And uh, we talked about, like, the character you portrayed. It's actually the contrast in, of Miss Piggy because Jenny is a sweethearted, respectful person that treated Kermit, uh, like, like I said, w like, you know, respect and just very kind, while Miss Piggy is more, like, narcissistic. Uh, she's right. very abrasive. And it was just cool to see that contrast. And that's why <laughs> at the end, that's why I was really laughing my ass off when I saw Miss Piggy get jealous of the fact that Jenny and Kermit were, you know, becoming, like, these, these good friends. <laughs> Yeah, they, I mean, they wanted us to be, um, they wanted me to be, you know, her to be jealous. They thought that was really funny. And, um, and so, and Frank was the director and he was also Miss Piggy. So that was kind of, you know, um, that was, I guess maybe that was also why they did it because 
a lot of my scenes would just, if she was in the scene, she would just be like looking and staring and being angry. But I just remember that was a really, that job was so fun. It took, usually they take about six months to shoot. They only shot, they shot that in three months. It was Frank Oz's first movie and um, Louis Zorich was great. He played my father and, um, and uh, Lonnie Price. Lonnie Price was great. Lonnie, I guess he's a director now. He played my, I remember Lonnie, you know, saying to me like, oh good, they shot a scene, they can't fire us now. And on the first day, and it was fun too, because um, I don't know if you know this, but um, Martin Scorsese has his parents, they loved, I don't, I, I don't think they're alive now, but they were, they loved doing extra work. Oh. being extras and they were extras every single day on the Muppet State Manhattan. Yeah. And you mentioned like, you know, like people appearing, like there was this movie had starstruck names. Like, I mean, you had Brooke Shields in this, Elliot Gould I, was in it. Gregory Hines was in it. Um, I'm trying to think there was a restaurant that Joan, Joan um, Rivers, Joan Rivers was in it. Uh, yeah. James Coco was in it. Dabney uh, Coleman. Yeah. Um, and then there was someone, Oh, R. Carney was in it. Right. Right. And, right, and I loved R. Carney's work on the Honeymooners. Like it's always me so too. Me too. He's so brilliant. So yeah, and everybody's really. I mean, the thing that that was great about working on the movie is everybody was really, um, like, happy. You didn't have anybody. There was nobody having. Um, oh, I have to have this or I have to have that because the stars really are Kermit and Miss Piggy, and they're not being. You know, uh, they're not being um, highlighted difficult so oh. that the other people coming in you know but yeah and you mentioned uh lewis zurich too he played your father in the movie and yeah. uh memories of working with uh, him uh lonnie price and r carney because there was a scene where all four of you were together at the very end right. of the movie um well lewis was great his wife it was um olympia dukakis i don't know i if remember her that. yeah and she was in um, Star. She was in um, oh, what's the movie with uh, Cher and um, and uh, Nicholas Cage? Um, I have to look it up. It's a Starstruck, or I, I don't know. It's a fam It's a famous movie. Anyway, um, and he's a really he's a theater actor, and he's um, really serious. But he kept cracking up because he was in the kitchen with all these uh, rats. And, you know, they were, yeah. <laughs> and so he would have a hard time. For some reason, he's like a real serious theater actor. But he would just, he would just have to say, we have to do it again. Because he'd just start cracking up when a rat jumped up or something. <laughs> and he didn't expect it. And, um, but he was great Lonnie Price was great Lonnie was um he was uh I mean I don't think Lonnie's acting anymore but he was uh and he played a producer and I think he's producing now which is interesting um and um so yeah and Art Carney is Art Carney is like a god so he's you know and uh, I got to ask you too, because I, I've seen works of uh, Louis Zurich, though. Like he was in Fiddler on the Roof as the constable. Um, was that accent real? Because I couldn't tell if that accent was real that he had. Like, no, it was, he made that accent. He faked that accent. He had no accent. So he wanted to make it um, because in New York, there's like, he wanted to, he wanted to make his character because he says, he kept saying, saying things over and over again and they thought that was really funny and so he did he wanted to play somebody from another country that you know no one could understand it so um well, i'm sorry you're gonna say but he had but he has no accent and i mean unfortunately rest in peace he passed away but he has he had no accent at all he put that that was all a put on accent now the, the Pete's luncheonette was that like a legit luncheonette or was that just a set? No, that was a set. They they used a new studio in Brooklyn at the time, and they built this whole set. And that was one of the main places that every day I got picked up. And in, in I lived in Manhattan, I got picked up and dro they drove me there. And um, 
and uh, that was a whole set that they built just for. They built up. They pretty much built everything there except the stuff they did outside. The film, the pieces that they filmed outside. I'll tell you an interesting fact about that luncheonette. Uh, that well, first of all, I went there like you know not that long ago, and it's now a McDonald's. That location in because I want to see what exactly Pete's luncheonette looked like uh, back then. It's actually oh. McDonald's. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but. They use that same exact the exterior shot of Pete's luncheonette they use on the Seinfeld show. Wow. Well, you know, they yeah. um they're okay. So I they had a scene, you know, at the end when we're when um in the audience of everybody clapping and when they're doing the their songs. And I've seen that same clip used in a bunch of other movies that I've seen. And so I was like, wow, I don't know if those extras know that they should be getting paid for all these other movies. So I don't know what they did, but they must have like allowed things to be to be taken out of that movie and used for footage to be taken out of that movie and used for other projects. Yeah, I agree with you, like, ro like royalties. Right, yeah. exactly, exactly. And I'll, some, I'll never forget the end of the movie, though, because you had not only the Muppet characters, but you had the characters from Sesame Street, Fraggle Rock, right, all right. When, and you were right there on stage watching all this when they had the song, Somebody's Getting Married. Like, right. it was such, like you and said. And the guy that married Piggy and, and um, Kermit was a real minister. So would you say they actually got, were legit married since he was a real minister? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> that wasn't yeah. an actor. He was a real minister. Now, uh, Chris, you had a related question, right? Yeah. So, yeah, any funny behind-the-scenes uh, stories you can share or when filming the Muppets Take Manhattan? Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I thought it was kind of fun that every day we saw Mr. and Mrs. Scorsese. They were always there playing different characters, so I thought that was kind of fun. Um the um the scene outside in um Bergdorf Goodman's the outside where Miss Piggy sees us where Kermit and I are talking um where they have the um the construction guys you know working that was um there was a lot of people gathered around there to watch that which I thought was interesting um and um the uh I'm trying to think of um all the scenes in that um it was it was just there was a it was a lot of it was a lot of interesting you know they, they a lot of the people that were working on that had worked on a lot of um like woody allen movies and um so there was a lot of people that knew each other um mia farrow came with her kids that day that we were in the park with um with Jim Henson and they she ended up doing a doing a thing in the in the movie and she was um she was lovely and she um you know she brought all she has a lot of kids she brought like all of her kids there to see to see Jim Henson so it was kind of like a big you know the thing that was kind of funny is here they are filming in the park I don't know if you could do that today where they could just all these people just come in and you know i don't know if they would allow that now with all the security and everything that everybody says but um um that was kind of interesting and also uh, i have dark hair and they were just like you know and my hair looks looked the same before and after but they made me go to a hairdresser in manhattan and I, I have no idea what it costs, but I think thousands to put highlights in my hair that you can't even really see. But that was something that I did in that, which I thought was kind of, you know, crazy. And then most of the stars that were there, I remember seeing Brooke Shields and she was, because she came out to um, the set, the studio, a lot of the stars that were filming other places, I didn't get to see. But um, one of the ladies that played Dabney Coleman's uh assistant was um gates mcfadden and she's a big star trek person oh yeah i've heard gates wasn't she on the next generation yes okay and she's um she's plays the secretary of dabney coleman in the muppet state manhattan oh okay i know D dabney 
and I said correctly, Dabney. Dabney, Dabney Coleman, yeah. I know him best for this cartoon that used to air when I was a kid called Recess. He played the oh, principal okay. on the show. Um, but yeah, and uh, Chris, you got a follow up with that, right? Uh, yes. So, uh, what was your favorite Jenny Liner scene? And before you answer that, uh, Miss Donald, can you like, at, at the risk of making us sound uh, look like uh, little kids again, can you say it like Jenny would say it? <laughs> oh no! I can't think of it. Um. Uh, oh, I can't think of a line, but um, I would be happy to if I could. Um, well, what about favorite scene? Um, I think my favorite scene was probably. My favorite day of shooting was the jogging in the park, but I think my favorite scene was when I meet Kermit when he comes into the um, into the diner and I tell him about that I'm in school and I'm studying fashion and all that. I think that's like those two are the scenes that stand out to me. So um, I was on that set for so long that um, you know every day for hours and hours a day. So. Um, a lot of the scenes get blended in, but um, even the last scene in the in the theater was on a set. So, um, but um, yeah, I think those. I think the scene I had with the scenes I had with Kermit were probably my favorite. Um, and I was going to ask you too as well. Like, would you say that those were your favorite uh, shooting locations while doing the movie? Yeah, it's it was sh being shot in the summer, and it was just so beautiful. You know, Central Park in the summer, it's just so beautiful. And it wasn't, I guess, before global warming, it wasn't really crazy hot, you know. And so it was, it was just really, really beautiful. And it was also really nice to be out in the park all day, you know. And uh, before I ask the next question, I too, I want to ask you something related to that too. Like shooting that last scene with the wedding, that looked like it took like a long time to shoot. Was that, was that accurate to say or no? It did take a long time to shoot because there were so much, so many um, characters and so many puppeteers there. That said, a lot of the puppeteers played multiple characters. And like, for example, um, Frank played, yeah. You know, so a lot of them played different characters. And that day they had Brian Henson and they had a lot of other puppeteers come in to play these other characters or to stand, you know, to do things like uh, to be Jim's uh, Kermit if he had to go do something. So it did take a while, but they're all, those people are, you know, um, so used to the way they work that, and they're so professional. And I, I didn't say something that I should probably say, which is when I got the job, I went to, um, they have a place in New York City that's the mup there where they make all the puppets. And I was shocked. Okay, so we're talking the 1983. So um, they were, they told me that a Kermit the Frog Muppet cost $30,000. Wow. So that would probably be nowadays, like what, 250,000 for a, you know, film. triple. Yeah, at least triple. So at least 100,000. And that's like, Kermit's the simplest. So just imagine some of the other characters. Like but they Bird. did it all by hand. And, um, you know, and so they had a whole way of working. And a lot of these guys have been doing um, puppeteering since they were in college. So now they're in their, I don't know, 30s or 40s, I guess, or I don't know how old they were when they were doing that. But they, they had years of experience. So that last scene, yes, it was very difficult. But if anybody could make it smooth, it was them you know they had so much experience and they also had so much experience being they they would laugh about this and tell me all the time that they were in these teeny tiny little spaces and there was like all these people in this teeny tiny little space you could be uh, you know uh uh you need to be okay with being around and they were used to that so they were used to like having like leaning back and all this because they would always be in these tiny spaces doing this doing the puppets and that was kind of, you know, interesting because here they, they're stars, but yet they weren't stars when they were working. 
I see. And we just got a couple more questions before we wrap up. Uh, Chris, you want to ask your final question? Um, so what teachings or important lessons have you learned in shooting Muppet Steak Manhattan? Um, I guess the important thing, you mean something important in life to learn, I guess, um, I guess being true to yourself. I mean, who would have thought that a hand puppet, these hand puppets would be so, um, powerful and mm -hmm. to be kind i think is the most important thing because that's something that they all were kind on that show and i think it comes across and i think that's why it's um people still love watching that movie i'm one of them <laughs> <laughs> um one of the final questions i have for you uh miss donald is what do you think of the impact that the Muppets, the movie Muppets Take Manhattan has caused on the new generation of fans nearly 40 years after its initial release? Um, I had a funny story. I, I was in an elevator and um, I was going someplace and this lady, and this, this, this lady kept looking at me and she had a, a little kid with her and she said, can I ask you a question? And then she said, were you the Muppets Take Manhattan? And I said, yeah. And she goes, oh my God, he's driving me crazy. We have to watch it 15 times a day. <laughs> so oh, I think the new generation is, you know, it's a generation now where you don't have to have a VHS or a DVD. You could just watch it, you know, you can stream. So um, I hope that, you know, it teaches kids to be, I hope it teaches kids like, you know, to be kind, I hope it teaches kids to have imagination. I hope it teaches kids to um, accept people no matter what they are and for who they are. And um, I hope it helps kids laugh and have, you know, um, some magic in their life. That's what I hope. Bless your heart for saying that. Those were beautiful words. And the final question I have for you, and this is the part, because my show is an open forum, I'm going to ask, What's next for Juliana Donald? Now, this is the part of the show where, so before you could talk, say whatever you like. I'm passing you the proverbial microphone. The floor is yours, Miss Donald. Okay, so I am now, I've kind of segued out of acting as I've gotten older. And I've been, um, this is a completely different thing that I do now, which is I became a gemologist. And um, I design jewelry now. So, um, and it's kind of fun because I use my imagination and I can draw and I can, um, so I have people that want me to go back to acting and agents and all that, but I've been kind of so filled with all this other stuff that I do and looking at the magic of the world. And I travel all over the world. I just got back from India in uh, December and um so it's just been kind of you know a completely different next step for me but it's been something i've been enjoying so very cool and before we conclude i just want to say thank you for not only an amazing interview but thank you for those years of memories you gave both chris and i watching whether it's dragnet whether it's muppets take manhattan Meryl's plays or uh, x x files or star trek you know you have this incredible gift miss donald where you can make a 30-something-year-old fan and bring them way down here, make them feel like that four- or seven-year-old again watching Muppets Take Manhattan. Um, and, you know, one last thing before we conclude, and and I feel, and um, don't you worry, I'm going to edit this uh, when it's fully completed. I'm going to send you a copy of this interview um, in case you want to share it or not. It's totally up to you. Uh, want to do that, but uh, I just want to also say thank you again for this interview and I waited a long time to do this. I feel like you deserve it, deserve this. And that is thank you, Julie. Thank you, Julie. Thank thank you, Julie. You, Julie. <laughs> thank you, Julie. It was such a pleasure having you on. You gave me so much memories as a child, like watching Muppets Take Manhattan. I'm actually going to rewatch it again just for the fun of it. Uh, later tonight. That's great. Well, it's great to meet both That's of you, great. and um, you know, and to go down memory lane, and to you know, and to hear that because every time I hear somebody say that about that movie, it always makes me feel good. And it's you know, it's people from like 
when I least expect. Like I've given somebody my credit card and they've gone, wait a minute. Oh my God, I watched you as a kid all the time. So it's just, you know, been kind of great. But anyway. Well, well, um, thank you. And one final thing before we go, I just want to say much like Jenny, you have a heart of gold, Miss Donald. Thank you for saying that. Thank Anytime. you. You have an okay. awesome night and you take too. care, everybody. Okay, take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.